Our second study in the Old Testament this summer is a set of five lessons from the Psalms, uh, beginning with today's lesson. Uh, the book of Psalms, as you know, is just an absolutely incredible book, quoted far more often in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book. And a thousand years in the making, uh, the earliest psalm that we know of, and some are not signed or there are no clues to, to uh, their age, but the oldest psalm that we know of was written by Moses. And uh, that continues at least to the return from exile uh, at, at the end of Old Testament history for uh, the people of God or near the end of that period. This was the hymnal of ancient Israel. Remember hymnals? They, they were big once. And many of our hymns, many of our worship songs come from the book of Psalms. Uh, a mighty fortress is our God. Luther got that reading the Psalms. Oh God, our help in ages past. That's the one that Moses wrote, Psalm 90. Um, Be still and know. Um, under his wings. There's so many more that are, are songs that we sing in worship because Israel sang a version of that thought in worship so long ago. And um, the hymnist has taken their words and made, the, made it possible for us to sing them as well. There is a, there's a common misconception. I'll say this as we begin our look at Psalms. There's a common misconception that all Psalms are praise Psalms. And that's not strictly accurate. There are many different types of psalms, a variety of types of psalms in the book. In, um, in a book like Psalms, you would expect that because unique to the Bible in a sense, whereas all the Bible speaks to us, the psalms, Eugene Peterson said, speak for us they verbalize what we're feeling. They're, they verbalize what we're experiencing in our own spiritual walks. And uh, honestly, it's not always praise, is it? Uh, sometimes it's desperation. Sometimes it's, 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 uh, it's, it's asking questions of the Lord. Sometimes it may be uh, looking back at what God has done for us in the past, or it may be looking forward to what God's going to do in the future. And the book of Psalms has all those characteristics as well. We'll see those as we go through the five studies. I wish we had even more, but as we go through the five studies in Psalms, we'll have several of those different varieties. Today's Psalm, Psalm 22, is a Psalm of lament. And it's just what the name sounds like. Uh, these are, I guess the closest musical category for us today would be the blues. In Psalms of Lament, Israel sings the blues, spiritual blues. Um, they are, they're songs of woe and of pain, of trouble in the book of Psalms. And over a third of the 150 Psalms are Psalms of Lament because they're honest outpourings to God from people who were in trouble and who needed him desperately. Um, they tend to follow a pattern. The first pattern, part of the pattern is to cry out to God, where are you? Second part of the pattern is to describe the problem. Here's what I'm facing. Third part is to plead for God, come to my rescue. Where are you God? I need you now. And the closing part is an expression of faith. You've been there for me before. I trust that you'll be there for me in this crisis and in any crisis to come. If Job had written a psalm, it would have been a psalm of lament, right? At least before chapter 42, it would have been a psalm of lament. We've just been studying Job and all that he went through. Now in the book of Psalms, we see a lot of different versions of people under different circumstances who are crying out to God like Job did. 
In Psalm 22, it's David. David is crying out to the Lord. How do we know? It's because this psalm is signed in a way. Uh, it doesn't show up in your quarterly because quarterly just prints the biblical text. But if you're looking in your Bible, or if you want to look later, under the number of the psalm, there is often a heading. And the heading is, it doesn't date from the NIV editors, it dates from the Hebrew editors who put the book of Psalms together. And they tell us often, not in every Psalm, but they tell us often uh, what the background circumstances were, uh, perhaps, or who the author is, perhaps. Um, sometimes they actually tell us the tune that Israel sang that hymn to. Uh, ours today is one of those. Uh, our heading says it's a Psalm of David. No surprise there, David wrote uh, approximately 75 of the 150 Psalms. So we aren't at all surprised to see this one is from him. And the heading says it's addressed to the director of music, meaning in the temple. And it also says it's to be sung to the tune of the Doe of the Morning. Anybody know that song? Would anybody like to stand and sing the Doe of the Morning for us? We don't know that tune, but Israel did. It would be like someone saying today, I've written a song and we're going to sing it to the tune of Amazing Grace. And all of us would say, we know that song. We can sing that tune. Israel sang this to that tune tune the dough of the morning, whatever it sounded like. So let's look at Psalm 22, this Psalm of David, and we're going to look at it on three levels. Level one, it's David's Psalm. Well, obviously it's David's Psalm. He wrote it. But we find out David experienced what he wrote. He says, I'm in trouble. We can't tie it to a specific event in David's life, but there are many times in David's life when this psalm might very well have been written. Maybe during that time when King Saul was trying to kill David repeatedly. Uh, maybe when the Philistines had a contract out on David's head. Uh, maybe it's when rebellion arose in David's own family and Absalom tried to claim the throne, and David's kingdom was in jeopardy, David's life was in jeopardy. Could have been any of those or any of a number of other times. David is in trouble. Our lesson begins with David's words in verse one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. A song of lament, and it fits the pattern. It opens with this cry for help. My God, my God. Not a more formal address like, oh God, or dear God, or uh, Lord of all, or any of the other titles that God has given in scripture, but but a very personal title, my God, and a very personal plea, why have you forsaken me? This is not a, this is not a generic psalm. This is, not, uh, this is not about suffering in general, although it certainly applies to those of us who suffer. This is from David's heart about his own pain as he wrote these words. It's intensely personal. My God, why have you forsaken me? More than uh, other religions, the God of Israel is a personal God. The God of scripture, the God we know is a personal God. And I don't just say that because the other gods are false gods. But in other religions, there's a distance between God and the worshiper that's not there in biblical faith. So David, the most natural thing in the world was for him to cry out, you're my God, where are you when I'm going through such turmoil? Maybe David was thinking, Lord, remember 
You tapped me to be the next king when I was just a teenager. Do you remember? Do you remember you guided the stone when I killed Goliath? Do you remember? Where are you now? Where are you now when I need you so desperately? You had your hand on me all the time. Where is your hand now? Verse 3. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted you. And you delivered them. Uh, let me pause here just for a second to look at the structure of of these verses because I think it's important as we see Hebrew poetry over the next five weeks actually the rest of the summer but uh, in Psalms for the next five weeks um, to to catch how the Hebrews wrote their poetry rhyme was not important to them and uh, the Poetry in the Old Testament doesn't rhyme. And it's not just because it loses its rhyme in translation. It didn't rhyme for the Hebrews either. They didn't try to rhyme. Their key characteristic in poetry is called parallelism. And that's a, a usually two line idea that may be stated in this, the, the same thought in different words or the same idea from the other side of the coin. And so what looks to us in English like repetition is intentional on their part. Uh, uh, look at the verses we've already read. My God, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Part one, part two. I cry out by day, I cry out by night. Uh, next verse, you're enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. Part one, part two. And so as you read through our lesson today, but the rest of the lessons through the quarter, um, watch for parallelisms. Uh, notice how the author makes his point and makes it with power through intentional repetition. There's more to Hebrew poetry than that. We'll find out some other things as we continue our study, but just that, that initial word as we begin. Back to verse 3. You're enthroned as the Holy One. You're the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted you and you delivered them. David is saying, Lord, you've been there for others. In fact, Lord, you were there for our fathers and their fathers and their fathers before them. Why not me? Where are you now? Uh, verse 6, he says, I'm an object of ridicule. Scorned by everyone, verse 6. Despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Not just ridicule, David says, I'm actually in danger, Lord. Verse 16, dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. It's not a hypothetical threat. This is real. David says, my life is in danger. And he's using... A, a vocabulary of proximity. They're near, they're close. Trouble surrounds me, it encircles me, it closes in on me. David felt very alone. So here's, here's level one of understanding the Psalm. David's in trouble and he's crying out to the Lord desperately. There's a second level. Since the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of this psalm for our benefit, that's why we have it in our scripture, we can read it on a personal level too. Not just as uh, information about David, but as a spiritual word for you and for me in our walk with the Lord as well. Because we've been there too, haven't we? And we've felt that and we've wondered why doesn't the Lord do something? And, and why aren't my prayers being answered? Again, like Job suffered in our previous study, his sufferings were not just physical, not just emotional. They were spiritual as well. 
we've wondered too, has God forsaken us? And we know he hasn't. David knew he had, but he felt it and he felt it very keenly. Why hasn't he healed me? Why hasn't he delivered me? Where are you, God? David said, you were there for my ancestors. Why aren't you here for me? David may have been thinking about his past and the Goliath story and the anointing story. We think about our past too. Lord, do you remember I gave my heart to you? Lord, do you remember my marriage is dedicated to you? We, we, our home is a Christian home. Lord, you know I've followed you in good times and bad. We, we say those kinds of things to the Lord. Where are you now? And yet, has God really forsaken us? You know he hasn't. So do I. But like David, it's hard to, to realize, to, to, to sense his presence. Uh, sometimes when we desperately feel like we need to. God may be silent. He's not really missing. Tennyson said, Closer is he than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. We just don't always feel that. Sometimes it's harder. Well, we burdened believers need to read the rest of the psalm. Um, this is a lengthy psalm, and the first half of it, first two thirds of it, actually, David is seeking. And in the last third, he trusts. The last third of the psalm, uh, say from verse 22 to the close, is bathed not in the dark of night, but in brilliant sunlight. Uh, for example, verse 23, you who fear the Lord, David's talking to us, you who fear the Lord, praise him. You descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel. And we're spiritual descendants of Israel. Uh, uh, David's, David's rejoicing here is so exuberant, he forgets about parallelisms. He adds a third thing. Praise him, honor him, revere him. David wants all of Israel to know in verse 23, God is there. Uh, verse 27, David says he wants the whole world to know. And in verses 30 and 31, he says he wants future generations to know. David closes the book by saying, God is there. And everybody should know that he is there. He has not forsaken me. He doesn't forsake any of us. Verse 24, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he's listened to his cry for help. These verses aren't in our printed lesson, but they really give us the, the note of hope that is so important in a psalm of lament. The closing line, David says, and it sounds like a shout to me, he has done it. God has come through. God has come through again, as he always does. If this psalm is for us, we can shout it. To. We can shout it here. We can shout it in heaven. He'll come through for us one way or another because he always does. I need to keep telling myself, stop living in the first half of the psalm. Move to the second half. Don't, don't stop reading too soon, Bob. Keep reading. Keep trusting. Keep believing. God does come through. So the second level to read the psalm on is your level and my level. But there is a third level to read the psalm on, and you know what it is. You've been there long before this moment in our lesson. This is Jesus' psalm, too. It's not just David's, not just ours. This is Jesus' psalm. Biblical scholars call it a messianic psalm. Well, can it be? a psalm of lament and a psalm of the Messiah at the same time? Yeah, it can. It does double duty, it is both. Because here there is prophecy of the Messiah. Remember, this is a thousand years before Jesus was born. 
And yet we see him, we see him clearly in these words of David. And David doesn't say Messiah here. David doesn't tell us it's a prophecy. I don't know if David knew he was being prophetic, but he was. We see Jesus in these words. Um, I, I think I've mentioned before a work of art I saw one time. Uh, it was the text of Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, one of the great speeches in American history about healing the nation after the Civil War. And it was delivered just days before his assassination. What made it a work of art? It's just the text of his speech. Well, the artist, instead of using brush strokes, the artist in bold print highlighted some of the words, in fact, some of the letters, so that if you step back, you could see the silhouette of Lincoln himself in his own words, in that, in that portrait of his speech. Lincoln inhabited that speech. You could see Lincoln in those words. Not quite the same way, but you can see Jesus all through the Old Testament. No, he is, hasn't been incarnated yet, but you can see him in the Old Testament because he's there. And here is one of the clearest places of all because there are incredible predictions and prophecies of the crucifixion in Psalm 22. If we look through a Jesus lens, look what we see. We've already seen David's anger, anguish, I should say, and his uh, humiliation. Jesus' humiliation is here too. Uh, verses 7 and 8, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Christ heard those words a thousand years later. The mocking words of the crowd at the foot of the cross. Uh, Matthew tells us first it was the passers-by. Remember the cross was erected at a place where it would be visible from the highway and the passers-by would mock the crucified, including Jesus. But then the religious leaders joined in and they echoed the same thing. Quote from Matthew 27, he trusts in God, let God rescue him. Straight out of Psalm 22, word for word. David had foreseen it a thousand years earlier. Verse 17, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Christ was stripped for the crucifixion to a loincloth. With his body extended as it was in crucifixion, the rib cage would be prominent the text says they can count all my bones. Jesus stretched beyond limits on the cross, was exposed in that way. And verse 18, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. How specific, <laughs> how specific. That's exactly what they did with Jesus. Dividing up his clothes and then deciding his robe was too precious to rip and so they gambled for it. David said a thousand years before, and it happened on the cross. Uh, humiliation of Christ in clear review. But so is also the physical suffering of Christ. Uh, verse 14 of Psalm 22, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Do you know that's one of the things that happens in crucifixion? Because as you hang from your hands on the cross, your joints are dislocated quite often and quite painfully. Uh, there is tremendous skeletal trauma in crucifixion. That's why the Romans practiced it, because it was so horrific. And can you imagine the Christ 
who was undoubtedly anchored to the cross on the ground, the cross piece would have been then inserted in the upright pole of the cross. Can you imagine what he felt when that jarring took place as that cross piece is let down into position? All my bones are out of joint. Verse 15, my mouth is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Uh, pot shirt is a piece of broken pottery. Christ thirst on the cross was severe. He was severely dehydrated, not just from crucifixion, but from the flogging that he had received from the Roman soldiers hours before. No wonder one of the sayings of Christ on the cross was, I thirst. And of course, verse 16, they pierce my hands and my feet. David wrote this a thousand years earlier. When David wrote it, crucifixion was not a thing. Uh, it was not practiced, not just in the Roman Empire. There was no Roman Empire when David wrote this. It wasn't practiced to any degree in the world that David knew. It certainly wasn't practiced in Israel. Uh, Israel executed by stoning. Why would David say they have pierced my hands and my feet? Again, I wonder if David wondered why he wrote that. Why, why he felt this impulse to put that on the parchment. They have pierced my hands and my feet. It's like a newsreel of the crucifixion. A thousand years before it happened. In clear detail. Well... This Psalm of Christ with speech so difficult because hanging on the cross the chest is compressed in such a way that it's difficult to fill the lungs of the crucified person. And that's why they had to push off with their legs to raise themselves up so that they would, would be able to get a chest full of breath. Remember, when the Romans were tired of their play, they would break the legs of crucified people. So they couldn't do that anymore. Uh, breath is at a premium to the crucified. And yet Jesus had things to say on the cross. And one of the things he said with this precious breath was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did the Father abandon Christ as he hung on the cross? because he was bearing the sins of the world. I've heard again and again that he did, and I understand. There's a verse in Habakkuk that said, God's eyes are too pure to look on sin. There are the words of Jesus as he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I am not confident that's what happened. And I'll tell you why. The last words of Jesus are not, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The last words of Jesus are, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. I see confidence in those words. Despair has given way to confidence. And, uh, and remember the end of the psalm that Jesus is quoting? David isn't saying anymore, God, where are you? He is saying in verse 24, he has not hidden his face from me. He has listened to my cry for help. I don't think God had abandoned Job when Job thought he had. I don't think God abandons us when we think he has. I don't think God had abandoned Jesus. That verse in Habakkuk that says his eyes are too pure to look on sin, that's a King James translation and it's not the best translation of that verb. The best translation is God doesn't condone sin. His eyes are too pure to condone or to tolerate sin. And the context of that verse in Habakkuk reads that way. It talks about the wickedness around that God will not put up with. But it, it doesn't mean in any definitive sense that for some reason God can't look at sin. I believe he looked at mine when he forgave it. I believe he looked at yours when he forgave it. 
what Jesus is crying out for here is based on the fact that in his humanity, he certainly felt abandoned. I have no question about that whatsoever. But he saw beyond human weakness and he knew the Father was there for him to commit his spirit to in the end. Yes, he bore the terrible weight of sins of the world. We cannot imagine the physical suffering of Jesus. There's no way we can imagine the spiritual suffering of Jesus. But he really wasn't abandoned by the Father when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So why did he say it? In part, perhaps, because that's how he felt. But I think there's a greater reason, and that was to call the attention of the people at the foot of the cross to this psalm. Uh, psalms don't have titles. You notice in our Bibles, this is just Psalm 22. But the Hebrews didn't know them by their numbers. The Hebrews knew them by the first verse. And so they would know this psalm as, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is Jesus saying from the cross, go home and read that psalm and you'll see what happened here today. Go home and read that psalm. It's not just about David, it's about me. And it's literally fulfilled in your presence today. I think Christ was naming the psalm. This messianic psalm of lament ends on a word of hope. Amazing psalm. Amazing prophecy in this psalm. Amazing provision for our need on the cross. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Alice? Amazing grace. amazing grace. We sang it this morning. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And it has an amazing conclusion. The psalm ends, for he has done it. And how did Jesus' experience on the cross end? It is finished. It is finished. God was there for me, David said, when he wrote the psalm. No withdrawal, no abandonment. He was really there all the time. You and I can say, we might have felt bad. We might have felt lost. The heavens might have felt closed. But we know he was there. There's no withdrawal. There's no abandonment. Jesus said it on the cross. God is there and we can trust him. Let's pray together. Lord, it, it's almost enough. For us to tackle anything that comes our way because we know you are there. Help us to look beyond our feelings. Help us to get beyond our doubts. Help us to realize, as David realized, as Christ knew, you don't abandon us and you don't forsake us. You're there. May this psalm and the truth that's in it make a difference in our lives as it has made a difference in the lives of so many millions across the years since 3,000 years ago when David put pen to parchment. We thank you for this truth and the love behind it in Jesus' name. Amen.